thing I heard was, you know, how do we tie math into education? So, you know, I just wanted to maybe start with that. So you know, I know I know that there's enough people here. I'm just, uh, um, uh, you know, let me just uh, start with games. I always like to play games. Okay? So, and uh, this is one way to actually uh, hook uh, people into math. And uh, we'll play a simple game, and then we'll play uh, another uh, game. So. Um, so my name is Pandu. I'm actually uh, uh, I wear multiple hats. I'm actually a faculty in mathematical sciences. Uh, uh, chair, Dr. Walnut is uh, and also I, for the College of Science, we have a program called the STEM Accelerator Program, and uh, where uh, the goals are to uh, help with uh, recruitment, retention, graduating on time, and uh, and and all in STEM, and also you know uh, being able to. Uh, find uh, a good place in the STEM workforce. So these are, uh, you know, so we try to find initiatives that align with these four goals. And, uh, and you know, right now there's been a lot of focus on the, on the retention and the graduating on time by, you know, establishing peer-to-peer -peer mentoring programs and lots of uh, different things, working with the various departments in the college. Uh, and now we're trying to build this connection to, you know, in the workforce. So, you know, there's several of you, you know, that are in the workforce and, some of you probably are, uh, you know, uh, can help with the recruitment part and all that. So, um, so I always, uh, any, any talk I give uh, uh, in the last few years, it's always been, uh, uh, you know, whether it's to third graders or even uh, earlier, or to uh, graduate students or to faculty, I almost always uh, start with this game. And I'd like to start off by flashing these three, uh, five boxes, which basically looks like numbers on a traditional what? Calendar, that's right. So, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to tell me in which boxes your birth date appears. So, if I was born on the August 24th, I'm going to look at, uh, you know, I can only be only about 24. I'm not, I don't want the August. So, I'm going to say 24. I see it here. I see it here. You don't have to tell me, uh, you know, your birth date. You're just going to tell me I see it in box number four, box number five. Any other boxes, it's there, but you have to tell me all the boxes. Does that make sense? Yeah. If you make a mistake, I'm going to make a mistake. Okay? <laughs> you want to try? Uh, sure. One and two. That's it? Yeah. Absolutely, sir. You don't see it anywhere else. Uh, unless it's a com yes. Something else, right? Yeah. One and two. Yeah. One and two. I'm just going to guess if you were one of the third, right? Yeah. Okay. Who wants to go next? So, let's try you, dude. So. <laughs> um, I'm in boxes uh, three, four, and five. Three, four, and five. And again, as I said, if you make a mistake, I'm going to make a mistake, right? <laughs> so if you're saying three, four, and five, I'm going to say to you, you were born one day after me. I was born on the 27th, 28th, right? Okay. So, uh, so here's a simple game, and you're you're starting to wonder what's going on here. Um, well, I mean, it may seem to you like a game, but uh, this uh, this some. Uh, very interesting uh, mathematics that goes on behind those boxes. Of course, these boxes did not just happen just like that. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, anyone figured out the strategy already? Yes. And adding the box number. Let's try that again. So, if my birthday is uh, so, you went to the one and the two, but uh, that's a good guess, though. So, if you're so, let me let me ask uh, you which boxes. Wow, very popular. So two, three, four, and five. Mm -hmm. Absolutely certain, right? Mm -hmm. So if it's two, three, four, and five, and you're, you're thinking I'm adding the box numbers, the answer should be what? You are not born on the 14th, right? Ah, so you must be born on the 30th or something. Yeah. Okay, so, but, uh, but what's going on though? So I wasn't adding the boxes, right? You're doing some kind of I'm doing some kind of calculation, right? So, uh, you know, math is all about some kind of calculation. So, uh, <laughs> Of course, the, the idea is, you know, what is the strategy behind it? So, of course, if you know the strategy, which, uh, you know, everybody uses it all the time. You use cell phones, you use computers, all of them think, uh, they don't think decimal, they think of uh, what type of system? Binary. Ah, maybe the answer has something to do with binary. Okay, so, and, uh, you know, of course, the code behind this is got the cracking, understanding this is, has to do with computer science and mathematics. So, you know, so, uh, since you guys are all here studying computer science here, so this has something to do with, uh, Binary. Okay, so and uh, I'm not going to give away the answer, but uh, you'll have to work on it and uh, you know maybe figure it out. Now, since uh, you know you asked me about uh, math and education, I did have some uh, you know I was not going to uh, do this. Uh, I, I didn't know about the time, but 
maybe I should do it. So uh, why don't we form groups here? So uh, why don't uh, uh, you join this group? So three of you, uh, you're five of you there. Uh, why don't you do the three of you there, the four of you there, and maybe the two of you. Why don't you start introducing yourself? And uh, uh, as you introduce, here's what I want you to do though. As you introduce, shake hands uh, also. Okay? So go ahead and introduce yourself. And here's what I want you to do, tell me. How many handshakes happen at your table? This is what I want you to tell me. Please shake hands. Oh. <laughs> I hope you were actually so I'm gonna pause for a second and quickly ask you know because I, this is the time I want to bring out the misconceptions so uh, three people right has to be how many answers six okay right six so this is the time I I want to uh, you know when, I, when somebody says six this is exactly the time I want to bring put my hat on in terms of teaching active learning. Why don't the three of you stand up for a second? Let's demonstrate the six handshakes, okay? So why don't you, yeah, okay, why don't you start, yes? One, yeah, two, okay, now it's your turn. Three, wait, wait. We did this already. Ah, I did this already. Let's, we, we just clarify the misconception, right? This is active learning. Thank you very much. So, okay, so, um, so, now we change your answer. Okay, so the answer is? Three. Wow, she just said six, and I just we just uh, got a chance to clarify that this is very common. Because, you know, handshake takes two people, I mean, two people, so three people must be three times two. But it didn't, it wasn't three times two, right? Because yeah. what is a handshake? You could ask me a question, what is a handshake? So, you know, if I shake your hand, you've already shaken my hand, right? So you don't double count, right? So the whole idea is I don't want to teach you a formula today, because this, you know, can be easily solved using a formula. And I work, uh, you know, I work with several kids that have gone to the, have represented the country for the International Mathematics Olympiad, the top six, but if I ask them to solve the same problem, they would just crunch a formula. But you know, it's about how to explain what just happened, and in education, this is very important, right? So, how do you demonstrate this? And you know, for example, if I were to just, uh, uh, you know, tell you what just happened, if, uh, if A, I'm just gonna call you guys ABC, and the natural configuration for ABC, let's say, is just, just a triangle. And you guys are sitting right next to each other like this, let's say. So A would shake two hands, right? So there's your two hands. Two handshakes, right? And then the B shakes one more hand, right? And so if you had we if you were to represent this, there was two handshakes and then one handshake, right? Right? So what do you think was the answer to there was a group of five people here? Five. Now I'm starting to think big numbers, right? So it's not that three is an easy one. So here's where you know, I, I don't want to throw a problem that is like 300 people, right? So I want to build a strategy of, you know, start with small numbers, this is all essentials of problem solving, and then build towards five. So if the group of five people, if you're directly started shaking and figuring out the number, that's good, but I would strongly suggest you start with a small number, right? So, and then this is exactly where we start to think, okay, what if I had the same idea, with two people, it's just be one handshake, right? Yeah. So with four people, what it, what would happen with four people? Three. Three. Plus very good. two. Plus two. Very good. Plus one. The two would be these, right? Yeah. And then plus. One. I'm just going to make this quickly so that I, I. And now we start seeing patterns. This is the beauty of mathematics, right? So, four people. That's three plus two plus one. Five people must be four plus three plus two plus one. And you start building these, you know, constructs, right? So let's suppose that you had like, if I ask you, oh, uh, what about 25 people in the room? And minus one plus. <laughs> oh, it's induction. Oh, I'm starting to hear all the time. <laughs> Not language. That's great, actually. But uh, let's think simple. That's great. Induction. Okay. So uh, three people plus two plus one. Four people was three plus two plus one, right? So what about 25 people? I just bumped up 24. Let's do that. 24. Plus 23 plus 22 all the way until what? One. Three and a two and a one, right? Yeah. But now we have a challenge. Now we need you know big computers to calculate <coughs> this, or maybe not. Remember, we made the computers; they can't be smart than this, right? So uh, maybe there's another important, easy strategy to actually figure out. And this is again uh, essentials in problem solving: is you look at these, and this is where you kind of uh, uh, see lots of maybe a rainbow. 
24 and 1 is what? 23 and 2 is what? Wait a minute. 22 and 3 is what? 25s. So wait a minute. There's only 24. I mean, how many numbers are there? 24, right? So that would be 12 pairs. That's 12 pairs of 25s. I mean, to just do 12 times 25. You see how we are actually computing it? And I still don't want to do multiplication. Because I know that 25 cents is a quarter. So I know that four quarters is a dollar. And so all I have to do is just multiply 12 quarters in my pocket, which is three dollars. And I'm not using any math, this is just 300. So for 25 people, it's 300 handshakes. So you can see how you can actually, now the reason I, I gave you this, this uh, in this exercise is, you know, this is how I work with 300 teachers in the summer, and you know, uh, he was uh, part of the program. And uh, so, uh, is to actually, um, you know, instead of teaching the formula, I could have written down, and you said n, n minus one and all that stuff for all the people who are math background, and uh, you know, the answer is actually very easy. What does it take for a handshake? Two people. There were n people in the room. Just select two of them. So it's n choose two. That's end of story. n times n minus one divided by two. That's a formula, but I don't want to use a formula. I want you to discover the formula. Of course, I will do a whole session on this, but uh, but that's when I get you to the formula. Okay. So so, uh, but the reason I did this example is for twofold. One, you said, you know, how do we connect math to education? Two, I actually was in Africa earlier this, uh, you know, uh, end of August and September, and this was the first problem I actually. So I was working with, uh, you know, two of our graduate students came along with us and. Uh, we were working with a group of uh, uh, 30 members. It's actually uh, 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 a project funded by the National Science Foundation, and uh, to work with uh, to increase STEM capacity in uh, in East Africa. And so I had close to 20 graduate students and uh, 10 faculty members. And so I didn't. I posed the exact same problem, but in a different way. I said, "You are in a room. Let's say like today, and 190 handshakes." happened, you know that information, but one of you have a contagious disease. <laughs> I would like to know how many injections or, or vaccines I need to get ready with. This is a big question for the CDC. If you know the number of cases for flu every year, and if I, if I you know, you know, you know, kids are like always shaking hands and things like that, I can backtrack and ask you the following question. This is what the CDC is actually thinking about all the time. How much should we be ready with? How many vaccines should you be ready? So think about it for a second. So 190 handshakes. Now I give you the number of handshakes, <coughs> number of interactions, and I can keep track of that. How you know different ways. The question is, how many people are in the room? Because that's the only way I can tell how much I need to be prepared. So now you're actually really seeing a connection to a real world application. Even though the handshake problem looks like a very simple classical problem, but it actually has you know if you think about fiber optics. How uh, you know how many cables that you need to give and things like that? It's all you know built into the handshake problem. By the way, this problem was not this idea was is not new. This is you know there was a, a teacher who wanted to give one plus two all the way to ninety nine, and she wanted to buy some time before she turned around. There was this little boy in the class who just said, "No, the answer is," and his name was Gauss. And uh, so this is sometimes you know just like Google is in the dictionary. This is what I just did here is. I was gulping it up. Okay, so, and uh, <laughs> this is just a uh, math lingo and uh, uh, in the in the in problem solving. So, what I wanted to uh, also show you is, uh, you know, maybe some pictures. Let's see if you can guess any of these people here. Um, anyone wants to guess? Uh, maybe this person here. Basketball, I know, but come on. If I show this picture now. Then this generation is not able to guess this person, but uh, those of you that were, you know, Robinson. Robinson, that's exactly right, David Robinson. But how many of you knew, this is 1991 rookie of the year, but how many of you knew his uh, mathematics background from the United States Navy Academy? Does a lot of things for mathematics. And, uh, you know, uh, this is Virginia Wade, uh, 1977 Wimbledon star, okay, mathematics and physics, actually. Maybe you know this lady. Yes? And you don't want to say it, but yeah, you probably know this lady, Terry Thatcher. Well, uh, physics and math back then. Okay, so uh, this is uh, uh, William Perry, uh, former Secretary of uh, Defense, who was involved in uh, the government board and the Bureau of Health Board and all that. And uh, this lady's become, you know, another celebrity. Who's uh, um, this is actually Connie Cooper uh, from the Wonder Years, and uh, she's become very famous because she wrote a book called Math Doesn't Suck. 
and uh, now she's on a roll. She's writing a second book, and uh, it's extremely popular now. So, especially when a celebrity does it, it's extremely popular, right? So, and uh, uh, how about this guy? This guy obviously is very important. Art Garfunkel, very good. Did you know that Art Garfunkel has a has a bachelor's and master's in Colombia in mathematics? Okay. Something uh, you know before you found another person to sing with. <laughs> so, so, uh, and uh, of course, this is Lewis Carroll. So you know, this uh, this is just an example I use for with kids actually to get them to understand. You know, uh, you know, there's lots of cool people who who have a mathematics background. Well, for those of you, here's a trivia for you all. So you know, there was this guy who joined a place called North Carolina and then ended up uh, you know in the first year declared his major as math, and then he figured out he was very good at something else called basketball. I'm already thinking, Michael Jordan? Yes. Michael Jordan was a math major, if you didn't know, for the first year. And then he just decided uh, he had some of the skill. Okay, so, <laughs> he could get paid for. So, but uh, uh, speaking of uh, celebrities, I just wanted to also bring this up. Uh, that one is, uh, I don't know if you recognize that person. No? Okay, but you don't recognize this person, Maldi. Uh, it's not a person, it's a, well, some people think it's a person. And all that. So this is of course Barbie. So who made the statement, uh, you know, uh, back in the uh, 60s, I believe, when they when it came and, and uh, you know. So when celebrities make statements like this, it's it's actually not a good thing in terms of you know. So uh, it's the, you know so many people going in front of an audience. For example, this is the 2013 uh, Miss America, Auburn University. Okay. So she was at a conference. Uh, she was invited to a conference, but you know, of course. She was always, she's always being asked, and she immediately recognized what she should be doing this year. You know that Miss America is tasked with some, something that, you know, makes their mark uh, that particular year. So she made one statement at some point saying, oh, I was, uh, I entered Auburn as a biomedical engineer, and then I decided it was too much for me. I took these math and uh, chem classes, and then I decided I, I will do fashion technology. So a statement like that from Miss America, okay, so, uh, but she took that as a challenge. Now she's uh, she's the ambassador for STEM. So one Miss America who is actually all for STEM now. So she goes to all these meetings. But uh, the the reason I'm I'm flashing these is uh, is because you know 40 percent of the kids that actually just think that they want to start STEM, uh, they end up in STEM actually. I mean, only 40 percent of them actually end up finishing STEM. So uh, somewhere along the line, you know, they change colleges, and so you always wonder what was that happened uh, to them. You know, was it uh, something that they got turned off from a class, or is it something that was too hard for them, or did they come uh, with a bad, uh, you know, with a preparation that was not very strong? For example, she accepted her preparation was not strong, okay, but ended up winning the similar competition. So, but, uh, uh, you know, so you can actually, uh, you know, everyone has to change. Of course, Barbie, when, <laughs> when Barbie made the statement, then, you know, uh, math is too hard, but let's go to the mall or something like that. So when she, when Barbie made the statement, it was really a big, big news. And it was basically uh, taken off the shelves and uh, they had to reprogram everything and all this stuff. You know, a statement like this can really change uh, the whole, uh, uh, I mean, people's thinking. So uh, I want to, you know, uh, talk about uh, a few things. Uh, this is just a slide that I wanted to, oh, Okay, the slide that uh, I wanted to just uh, uh, show uh, in terms of, uh, so 30 people from the US were asked to put one slide on modeling. This is something that I, uh, you know, so we were all asked to do one slide. And uh, the reason they are, what is happening in the nation right now is you all know AP statistics, AP biology, AP, uh, you know, chemistry. Oh, the next big thing is coming, AP modeling. Okay, so it's around the corner if you didn't know, that's coming and so the high school students need to get ready and this means the universities will get ready, everybody will get ready because you know modeling is going to be a big deal uh, in the next few years and uh, math is going to play a huge role in this one. So, and uh, I, I'll, I'll talk about how the modeling project, so we actually in the math department we run several uh, you know outstanding uh, undergraduate research projects, we have the National Science Foundation funded uh, research experiences for undergraduates where we bring about 12 to 13 students and two teachers uh, to campus and they work with us for nine weeks uh, and uh, produce something that is actually even publishable and, uh, and the teachers are actually uh, taking this back to their classroom and they do what is called as lesson study of ancient you know, Japanese form of uh, uh, style of actually collaborative lesson planning and things like that 
And, uh, and then we also have another successful program is called uh, uh, URCM, Undergraduate Research in Computational Mathematics. Uh, I guess, were you part of that? No, no, no. Right, okay, so, and you, you could be paid to do research, that's the best part as a student. And so, and, uh, and, and so you know, here's one of the students, uh, you know, where the project that was, came from biology, uh, bioengineering, and actually, you know, how it turned into a math and a physics project, and then how it went all the way to the capital, and uh, you know, uh, got the attention of uh, senators and you know, that's not honor that's standing there with the GMU. So and uh, um, and so you know, so it's uh, it's, it's actually great to uh, you know send the message in terms of you know math can be applied to real world problems. And I will be sharing with you how, how this project transformed. Of course, uh, I do work with teachers, about 300 of them, and I guess uh, you know, I'm glad you, you could come today. And the teachers actually take this back in their classroom. As uh, This is a high school conference. We work with middle school and, and also uh, I mean, K through 12. And uh, uh, we have other programs where we work with students too. So I'll, I'll summarize these slides later on. So, uh, I've been fortunate to get funding from uh, lots of agencies. Uh, uh, you know, of course, the National Science Foundation, which is, you know, which is big on uh, promoting, uh, you know, uh, you know, broadening participation and, and STEM. Uh, also, now all the latest uh, uh, types of initiatives starting today. Now that they passed the bill yesterday, so uh, hopefully, enough of people will get their jobs back. So uh, then they will actually have, uh, you know, they'll be going towards. Uh, uh, the idea of uh, uh, STEM uh, experiential learning. So, you know, what is experiential learning? People are throwing this word everywhere. And uh, many of the, you know, even STEM is a word that people are always trying to, uh, you know, use that in different contexts. And uh, and I'll give you one uh, one context also. So, uh, and, you know, I'll be showcasing some of the, uh, my standard uh, and some of the projects that came out of that. And these are some former ones, and then the Emerging Department of Education and the State Council that funds uh, these projects in the summer. Um, so uh, let's talk about where did uh, STEM actually come from? Well, another picture for you. This is uh, really cool. Okay, okay. So uh, President Roosevelt, I mean, this is back in uh, uh, 1944. He posed this question to the uh, uh, Office of uh, Scientific Research. Uh, the, the, the director of the, of, the, of the program then was uh, Vanavo Bush. So he said, you know, could we come up with a program that can, uh, you know, uh, uh, somehow uh, increase the uh, uh, you know visibility and uh, so you know if you go back and track when STEM was introduced and the word did not come through so somehow they you know people go back to this one question that he asked and uh, and what happened was in response to that uh, you know this is uh, when I would wish responding saying well we can do that but we need to really find these rare individuals okay who will uh, uh, you know, they should be an exception, and so it was. Uh, so they really wanted to actually come up with this this uh, uh, examples of people that can actually uh, make a difference. And so they ended up actually uh, drafting. So this conversation went back and forth. 1950s happened. The Sputnik era started, and then you know the uh, there was like a response from the Americans. You know what happened in 1969, and then all of a sudden, 1970, everything died. You know, like, you know, some other culture started and lots of things until 1985, nothing happened. Okay, so uh, people are just going to school, studying, getting their PhDs and all that stuff, but nothing, that STEM thing that started kind of suddenly stopped. In 1985, back again, people uh, recognized the need for, oh, what's going on I mean, uh, in other countries? They so quickly started right now, just to give you an idea, you know, yeah, when middle school children take these this test called TIMS, uh, which is a worldwide test, you know, uh, when we are ranked somewhere in math and science in, as number 26. Uh, you know, this country is like Lithuania, it's, uh, and you know, the, which are uh, much uh, have a higher ranking. I mean, the, if you look at the top two, Singapore and uh, and Finland, I mean, their motto is uh, learning by doing. That's Finland's motto. And if you go to the Ministry of Education in Singapore, their motto is teach less, learn more. So you start to get this philosophy of you know learning by doing is becoming a big culture, and now you know that is uh, you know the U.S. is uh, you know uh, coming up with lots and lots of programs that will help initiate these types of uh, experiential learning. But talk about bringing that to mathematics, learning by doing, you know. So uh, so that becomes a challenge for even educators to actually implement that type of a concept. And so, uh, but you know, I think. Uh, if, if any country can do it, US can do it. So, you know, that's the whole idea. So, if you bring the right group of people together, and I think this is not something that's very really hard. 
And uh, so they climbed, so the, there was a two big reports that came out in 2012, uh, first, you know, uh, from uh, Principal Obama's committee, and then there was this report, and they actually coined this word called STEM innovators for the first time in college. And then they gave these uh, uh, potential STEM innovators, you know, what should we be looking for? So, well, they actually um, wrote down the three uh, keystone recommendations. They said, you know, we need to provide opportunities for excellence. Uh, of course, it needs to be coordinated because there's so many good things that are already happening, but it's, it's about coming together. So, you know, I mean, I learned about the International Math Olympiad and I was talking about some of the competitions. So this is how we come together and say, oh, we could probably think of something together. Uh, casting a wide net, so it's not just, you know, you're looking for these special people. It's for, you know, uh, people think differently, people think pictorial, people think algebraic, I mean, arithmetic, and, you know, they can think differently. So capturing these different learners, you know, they may be kinesthetic. So it depends on, uh, you know, uh, us educators to actually turn, uh, yeah, turn, uh, turn their learning into, you know, give them opportunities to learn different, different ways. So a non-traditional uh, STEM learning, for example. And then, of course, that's that's how we foster, uh, you know, supporting uh, the system. So uh, this is the accelerator program. I just wanted to give you a quick, uh, you know, same same slides here. So, but uh, we have a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring program. Uh, works with all the colleges, and uh, we run boot camps. We uh, we will be doing uh, uh, middle school academies, high school uh, uh, research uh, institutes, uh, teacher. Uh, 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 professional movements and uh, workshops and uh, so lots of uh, uh, you know initiatives that will be happening in the next few years uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm trying to make sure I coordinate things that are already successful and trying to bring people together to be able to do this uh, so let me talk a little bit about what does it take you know, what does really multidisciplinary research and mathematics mean well mm -hmm. The NRC actually uh, says that you know you can't, and even though it says undergraduate education, it holds for graduate education uh, also. So you know nobody can, we can't just work alone. That's that's uh, now very clear. I mean yes, mathematics is one of those subjects where you can really think alone, sit in a room, write a proof, uh, maybe write a computer code, simulate, publish, and things like that. But but it's even better. Even when you do that, you actually capture two of the three things. You may be very good in theory. You may be very good in coding and numerics, but then we can be also good in experimental work, for example. So I could write out all these nice theory, I could write a nice program and simulate it, but then I go and apply it to the real world, it doesn't even match the real world. But then that's easy, we'll just fake some data and then you know, uh, show that the method is strong enough. Now that is significant also, is to show that a method works, a scheme converges and all that stuff, that's not easy. But then this is where the whole idea of, you know, experiment just talking to numer numerical people and people talking to theory. So it's all uh, linked. And so my philosophy is, is very simple. You know, anything I teach, anything I work on, you know, our educational system, the whole world, it's not like in China, India, uh, you know, uh, US. We all think that when we go to teach, it's, uh, it's more like, uh, you know, here is the mathematics, let's go solve the problem. Here's the physics, let's go solve the problem. It seems to be the big philosophy of all educators. Okay? But if you can actually turn that around and simply turn that philosophy into, you know, here's the problem, let's find the mathematics to do it. Because I gave you the handshake problem. I could have told you the contagious disease, how I presented in Africa, and then I started this whole thing. Then you may think you put some real uh, world context into it and then solve the problem. But then I didn't really say, give me the mathematics. I said, solve the problem. Use physics or chemistry or whatever you want. I don't care. But solve it so the whole idea is you know the problem is already in front of you and so it is hard this philosophy of changing from here is the mathematics go solve the problem to here's the problem find the mathematics to do it it's not that easy but it is actually something that can be learned and uh, and this is something that I try to preach as much as possible and uh, so uh, some of the traditional areas that get uh, you know for example uh, uh, that uh, are very popular and in terms of multidisciplinary is definitely uh, basic scientific research. Uh, global health, okay, so now the new initiatives being STEM H, you know, and then, uh, you know, that's another big thing, you know, uh, for example, Mason is trying to, uh, in the next 10 years, we are trying to increase the number of uh, students graduating in STEM H, about one third of the majors, okay, so, and uh, you can actually uh, see the importance of math that will be coming into STEM, I mean, I gave you an example already, uh, defense, and I'll give you some examples later on. 
uh, sustainability of the environment, uh, energy, agriculture and food security. It's another big thing that uh, you know uh, that you can uh, work on. And uh, STEM education. It's another uh, huge area. So these are all you know. I'm just throwing some of the areas. Now some of the areas that I have worked with uh, in students, uh, with students with uh, fluid structure fraction. I see some students who work with me in fluid structure. Uh, you know, porous media, nonlinear dynamics, mathematical biology could be epidemiology or uh, ecology. Uh, you know, or stochastic differential equations. It looks like a jazzy word, but it all it all it is is great applications to. If only people understand this area, the markets would not be doing what it's doing. Okay, so uh, people don't understand this area. So that's why there's so many open research problems in this area. We have some phenomenal research. Uh, I mean, mathematicians who you know uh, who work on this area. So you know, so. If uh, taking those classes, really understanding what uh, you know, what stochastic means, and trying to understand uh, methods, and I'll give you an example in just a second. Um, so, in terms of modeling, though, you know, which is something that I is dear, you know, near and dear to my heart, is uh, you know, you start by looking at your environment. I was watching, uh, you know, you all, and I was observing, and then uh, you know, basically, you come up with some kind of a theory. You know, this is the hypothesis that you're saying. You know, I think this is true. And then you try to formulate some kind of, uh, it could be equations that you're formulating, or just you know some kind of uh, rule that you're formulating. And then you have to describe it, you have to really make some interpretations of how that rule applies to the real world problems. And then you really analyze it. Now this could be mathematical analysis or experimental analysis, you could do whatever analysis you want, and then typically that's backed up with a computer code. So this is the simulation part. And so this is all great, but then the part of validation is the most important thing. So a mathematician could sit in a room and write a nice proof, or write a nice computer code, but if it does not actually match the actual data that somebody is collecting, then the whole thing is not complete. So you know, so the validation and prediction are very important things, and this is a huge area in mathematics called parameter estimation. So you have a model, you actually simulated it, but it doesn't match the real world data. So how do we make sure that the model Will match the real world data, so you want to do, you want to see how these two can be closer and closer uh, to each other, and this bringing them closer and closer to each other means you're changing something in the model, changing the parameters in the model. So how do we estimate those parameters better? And bringing them closer and closer in mathematics means maybe something like a least squares, you know, so things that you use in Excel as regression, for example, nonlinear regression. For example. So and uh, so there's lots of uh, you know neat mathematics hidden in each of those. Uh, those, those topics there, and uh, but one thing you know, I like this quote very much about all those models. You know, everything is wrong. Everything when they say I'm modeling something, everything is wrong. But the good news though is that uh, you know some of them are more wrong than the others, so we can always go for the others. Okay, so um, you know this is a very famous quote, and uh, you know so um, of course you can't be perfect. The whole idea of being a model is it's not exact, it's approximate. So that's the whole idea. And let me give you a simple example. So here's the, uh, I don't know how many of you remember the Patriot Missile Failure, which is uh, 1991, uh, uh, the Gulf War. So, uh, you know, it led to what, uh, you know, death of 28 soldiers, lots of million dollars of, uh, in loss. And uh, here's exactly what happened. So the Patriot Missile is supposed to be tracking an incoming Scud Missile. And so what it does is it basically has, it keeps actually circling and it actually monitors a certain radius. And so the incoming skirt, when it comes in, into a certain range, it's supposed to go up and it actually is supposed to intercept somewhere and then, you know, so that uh, everything is good and nothing happens. So what happened was, uh, this was based on a, on a simple arithmetic. And the arithmetic, uh, so let me ask you, David, if I ask you what is one third, what do you say? One third? One third, okay. If I ask you one third, what do you say? It's a repeating decimal point three. It's a repeating decimal point three. So some people, yes, so you said 0.3, so I'm going to take that. So, uh, so you said 0.3333. So both of you are pretty, you know, good in not disclosing. So, but if I ask other people, some, some of them say, oh, it's 0.3. It's like an educated guess. Oh, it's 0.33. Now let me repeat the same question. I'm going to give you a salary raise, and I'm going to give you one third of your salary. Do you like $33 or $30, right? So, <laughs> so is that $3 important or, you know, so that extra percentage of extra decimals is very important. Is that clear? So that's, I'm glad you just said 0.3333 or one third, because one third of your salary is much better than 0.3 times your salary, right? So, uh, so that, that extra decimals matters. And that actually is what happened here. So the code was actually, it was a huge code. Somewhere in the code, there was a for loop. 
And inside that loop, so loop for loop means keeps doing it again and again. Inside that loop, a, com a calculation was being done. The calculation was 1 over 10. In 1 over 10, uh, of course, uh, computers understand fully binary. So 1 over 10 was computed as follows. Remember that it doesn't uh, continues. And so the computer could only store 64 uh, digits there. So basically it chopped off. And because it chopped off the number of digits, uh, there was a small error there. And because of that, the actual number that was represented, there was that error in, in, when you get it back from binary to decimal, that's the error that came back. Now that error turned into a clock error. So once you have the time, then you can actually multiply it by the speed at which this cut is coming, and you can actually find the range k. Basically, distance equals rate times time. That's all the calculation was. But the time clock error led to something that miscalculated the radius. And because it could not calculate the correct radius, the cut actually came in. And painted himself with one And of course, um, if you go and read out, read the GAO report for this, they'll say it's a computer arithmetic. Okay, so, but uh, of course, somebody got blamed for this. So, but the thing is, you know, some poor programmer will see that uh, calculation somewhere. Okay, so, but the thing is, uh, the whole idea is, you know, why did this mistake happen? Well, round off error, something that we need to learn about in the class of the class. So, first thing that I teach next, next semester, I'll be teaching 685, which is the numerical methods in computing, and so on, numerical methods, uh, numerical analysis. First example I do is this, and then we go into the details of why this happened. And uh, so these are just classic examples of models going wrong. And, uh, and, and this has something to do with probably also, you know, how scientists think about it, and we are in a share your science, but you know, I actually have a bachelor's in electrical engineering, then I did my master's and PhD in mathematics. So, but, uh, you know, so, there's a way that engineers think versus the scientists think. You know, the scientists are always looking for those big questions, but the engineers want to solve these big problems. And uh, we have this whole philosophy of inquiry-based uh, you know, design for scientists, but, but the, the engineers are doing completely like a design-based. You know? So failure is okay for engineers because they can always improve the model. But then you know, the scientists are looking for that one big result. Right, so you know, of course, you have to do so many trials and all this stuff. So there's, there's definitely, you know, uh, you can make analogies to both of them. In fact, uh, uh, here's a list of things that I have. Is you know, you know, if you are a sci, you know, scientific method is typically posing a question, but an engineering method is defining the problem. So it's a very simple philosophy uh, that, that each one, each one of us actually think about. Now, because I have an engineering background and worked for G for some time, and then I went on to uh, pursue my, uh, you know, PhD in mathematics. I could actually relate to how both people are thinking. For example, here we research the question, here we research the problem. Right? So, and uh, we test hypothesis there, here we test prototypes. We actually build stuff in the engineering world. And you actually test it out, fails, and then you improve the design. And so that whole parameter estimation thing is already built in by hands on. But you know, you don't know exactly how many times you'll be doing this. You know? so, you have one product today, tomorrow you'll have another one with another version, and then another one with another version. IPod, you know, I, I, you know, iPhone's coming with a new color, tomorrow they'll have something else on the iPhone. So, you know, so those types of things, you know, as, uh, looking at the market and all that. So it's more of a question based and a more of a problem based. So this could be something that could be, you know, this is something where STEM actually brings these two together, and math plays a huge role in this, this whole idea. And uh, what I want to do now is uh, go through a bunch of projects. I'll take uh, about 10 to 15 minutes to just go through the projects. So this is one project that I have worked on. It's basically um, you know, about 2 to 5 percent of the population in the United States actually harbor what are called as uh, intracranial sacular aneurysms. So these are sac-like structures that you see here. This is actually top view from your, on your head. And uh, this is these guys that are sac-like structures. These are called aneurysms. So they, these things are focal demonstration of the arterial wall. And they just come up and then they just keep uh, becoming bigger and then they just go. And uh, so once they rupture, there's no good news because 50% of them die, 50% of them get a neurological disorder. And uh, so one classic, so here's an aneurysm that has a narrow neck, here's one that has a broad neck, there's one that is fused with the uh, you know, aneurysm. So we actually had a student just do a PhD just on looking at the mathematical stability of such aneurysms. And uh, so one, the gold standard is to actually, you know, uh, uh, you know, you know, the patient is cut open and going inside and now, you know, the surgery, so going and placing this metal stent. So the idea being what? What's the purpose of placing a stent? What do you think it does? The blood flow, that's right. So the blood 
it will do its normal chores, it will not start going and hitting the walls. Because the whole idea is that the blood is impacting a wall and the wall breaks. That's the whole idea. So and so to avoid that, you know, they put the metal clip, but you just left you just left the metal in your body. So you have to understand that if you're gonna go for that procedure, there's gonna be a metal in your body. So and what happens to the metal is you know, this depends on uh, you know how much you how much the doctor can tell you about uh, you know what its effects are and all that. This is more of a uh, last ten uh, last ten years is where where uh, you know it's called uh, endovascular occlusion. Now you may be wondering what's the mathematician talking all these bio language. Well, I actually was a bio I was in the biomedical engineering program right after my PhD in uh, applied mathematics. I actually wanted to go to a completely different department. This was my choice, and I had had a choice to go to some very good departments, uh, mathematics departments in Minnesota and in different schools. But I decided to go here because I wanted to be challenged in an environment that I know nothing about. So I went there, and I, you know, in a biomedical engineering department, you know, 17 students would show up every single day, all the way from undergrads to grads, and they would cut open chicken hearts and they were little from eggs, and I don't know how they managed to do it. And they'll put it under a, under a, you know. Uh, under some kind of experiments, uniaxial, biaxial, and then they'll give me data. That's where I come in. So, you know, I was the mathematician actually taking the data and telling them if that tissue was weak or strong for my mathematical calculations. And that's what they want to know. And, and so imagine, uh, you know, somebody who is in a, a patient in a hospital and they have the aneurysm immediately shipped to us within 24 hours in saline solution. And the experiments are done, and we actually tell them back what happened and things like that. So, what could have happened in the patient? And so, those types of uh, uh, studies can be can be done here. So, this uh, procedure doesn't require a invasive surgery. It only requires like a poking a hole and you know going uh, sending this wire called uh, uh, you know thrombogenic wire, and it goes and occludes that part, and that's why it's called endovascular occlusion. And the blood flow is restored. So there's a lot of uh, you know good things that you can do. So here's a toy simulation by you know a high school student actually. So uh, where you know blood flow is coming and which is basically modeled using Navier-Stokes equations. So you have the aneurysm which is actually going up and down. This is just to provide insight. Nowhere in your body is this artery so straight. On a computer you can do all that stuff. So but uh, this gave us a lot of insight into you know different things like flow and flow rates and things like that. And uh, another problem that I uh, I picked up on when I was uh, 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 a fellow at the uh, uh, Wright Patterson Air Force Base, a summer faculty fellow, is uh, these things I got introduced, these things called micro air vehicles. These are micro, this is, this is the size of a pencil. And so these are vehicles that are, you know, uh, they were initially designed for military surveillance and uh, reconnaissance and all that. But then, uh, uh, you know, when I was the, uh, working there in one of the summers, that's when Katrina happened. And uh, so we were saying, you know, why, and uh, we were saying, why don't you find good uses for these guys? You know, why don't you send them into buildings where there's fire, for example? So most of the time, firemen die because they go into buildings where there's nobody, and you know, they have they have this reverse, uh, you know, secondary flow that comes and you know just gets them. And uh, and same thing with you know going into buildings. So why don't you send these guys? Because these guys have the ability to carry a video recorder, data logger, everything. So you know, so the idea was. Uh, you know, what can you do with these types of, how can you design these? So, initially DARPA was interested in designs like this, where they actually took something like a rigid Boeing and just shrunk, uh, made it smaller and then they designed it. But then they looked, uh, you know, these guys didn't, were not stable, they would just go bang into walls. You know, they, they were all, um, you know, video controlled and all this stuff. But then they looked, at, looked around, birds and insects were doing such a good job. They would come so close to an object and they would escape. So MIT has a whole lab just looking at bats. Uh, and bat models for babies. And so, out came the next generation uh, uh, problems, which is basically flexible things. And to me, it's the same problem as the last one. I had the blood that was flowing inside the arterial wall. Here I, so that to me was a fluid interacting with the structure. But then this also is a fluid interacting with the structure. The structure is clear, it's the wing. What's the fluid? The air around it, that's exactly right. So the air around it is, so I could actually try to model this piece here. So, and this was, a, a, give you an idea of, uh, so you know, this lots and lots of application, now they're thinking of putting these guys in the border to monitor, you know, uh, traffic monitoring and all that stuff. And um, so the challenge of these guys is the small size, the speeds at which they travel and lots of uh, things that, so I'm interested in the structural aspects and the fluid aspects, which means, 
you know, I'm interested in modeling the fluid around it, uh, which, is the, uh, which is the Navi stones, and then uh, the, this is this I could model it as some kind of a beam and things like that. These are nice mathematical equations, four power equation, and uh, you know, with velocity and pressure, and you have to really understand how do you couple. So I'm not showing you mathematics, but there is a lot of mathematics in you know coupling the velocity with the displacement of the beam. I mean, the derivative, time derivative of the displacement of the beam. And so these are simple examples that I'm showing. Uh, but then, in general, you want to do something uh, complicated. So, for example, you want to model if there's a building there, and you want to model like a tornado coming from this end, and you know you want to see how the building is going to, uh, you know, how fail or uh, you know. Again, you could you could think of lots of applications. So, you know, you are actually seeing, you know, you could capture lots of things like secondary flows here. So, then what could this flow actually do to this building? I think so. Will it be protective? So, will it be you know, destructive and all the, all these different types of things. But there's a lot of you know modeling. There's a lot of mathematics to understanding the stability that goes behind these these problems and all that. So, uh, so what are typical first steps? So you know, you have all these physical systems and you want to turn that into a mathematical model. So uh, I'm going, since I did not write a whole lot of equations, this is probably going to only write some equations. So let's uh, let's say you want to model population. So let's talk some calculus. So if I want to model a population, the simplest thing that you can think of is that the population is directly proportional to, this, uh, to its size, right? the rate of change of population. Right? So, and that's the, probably the simplest model you can think of. So for example, the rate of change of population is directly proportional to its size, right? So which means you can change that proportionality statement to an equal to statement like that. And then you can use like heavy machinery from calculus one and separate the variables and actually solve this problem and actually solve this to the point where you actually see the word, the letter E there, right? So, and uh, we'll talk about E later on. You all know that E has something to do with exponential. And so you get the solution, which is Y naught, which is the initial population times E to the KT. K is the growth factor. It's either growth or decay based on what uh, model that you're studying. And, uh, and then you can actually uh, plot this, but this is very useful because uh, if I know the population in 1984, I can tell you what the population is going to be in uh, in a certain year. So you can actually predict it using these types of models. You often call this initial value problems. Now that's you know a textbook calculus problem. How would you turn that into a real world problem? For example, I want to find the interaction between uh, Canadian lynx and snowshoe hare. I want to model this. I want to work with an experimentalist who's collecting this data. Well, where do I go? I'll go back to calculus. Well, what did you learn in calculus? Well, I can actually model the species interaction. Maybe I should start by just modeling, let's say, the prey. Now, if I were to just model the prey, then let's suppose that I have a room, and uh, I'm putting all these prey inside, these snowshoe hair inside. There's plenty of grass to eat. That's my assumption. So they're going to be eating a lot, and uh, they do nothing but uh, you know breed and they reproduce. How fast do they reproduce? Exponentially. Well, don't we know an exponential model from calculus? We do, I just showed you, right? So I could say, well, maybe that's what I need to do. So why is the prey? Well, here's my model. Alpha 1 is my growth rate. And so this models the exponential growth of the snowshoe hair. Now I'm going to be mean, I'm going to open the door, I'm going to throw some links inside. So the links are going to start eating the prey. So when the links start eating the prey, I need an interaction between the links and the prey. That's, if I call the links x, x needs to interact with y. Now that could be x times y, x squared y, x y. This is where you need to know really uh, the experimental data. Well, if I just say that it's proportional to the product, so it's basically it's going to be x times y. But notice that I have a negative sign because remember this equation is talking about the dynamics of the prey. The prey goes up because it's reproducing. The prey goes down because it's being eaten by. So that's the simple model for the prey. Well, what if I change this whole philosophy and have plenty of grass here, I throw a lot of Canadian lynx inside. And let's start the modeling for the Canadian lynx. But what do the Canadian lynx do? They're all meat eaters, right? They don't eat grass. They're gonna sit there and die. So how would you model that? Well, that's very simple. How do you model that? Same equation, right? Very good, you're already modeling, right? So you just have a negative sign, that's all it is. But now I'm gonna make them happy, I'm gonna open the door, throw some social hair, so obviously they're gonna go. So now we just turn the calculus problem into something that is, you know, heavy duty applicable, right? So you can take this and apply this to endangered species conservation. And all you need to know is that uh, what's the initial population of this uh, of the prey? What's the initial population of the predator? And then you can actually talk about different techniques to solve these problems. So I'm going to skip this one. Um, 
So you got a physical system, you turn into a mathematical model, and then the next thing is open up a textbook and find out if there's an analytical solution. Is there an answer? Well, <laughs> unfortunately, there's not always an answer, right? So I always give this example. Uh, you know, this is how I try to connect. I had I was working with biology teachers this summer, and the math teacher sitting next to them. And I asked both of them the following question. Actually, I didn't draw a square, I actually drew a circle. And I said, imagine this is your petri dish under the microscope. And you're looking at bacteria growing. How does bacteria grow? Bacteria doesn't grow in a triangle. Or it doesn't grow like a square. It grows like a blob. Now, in which book do we teach the area of a blob? We don't. How are you telling me that there's 200,000 bacteria? I asked the biology teachers that. And they said, oh, we just calculate. How do you calculate? Said, oh, we just use a spectrophotometer. They just told me a big device. I said, do you know how a spectrophotometer works? Oh, they said, oh, it's easy. The, the, the bacteria absorbs certain light, and we just write a relation. I mean, it, it just tells me exactly the intensity is proportional to the amount of bacteria. I said, do you know what law that is? It turns out it's a, it's a logarithmic law. There's a math in it. It's actually the same exact law that tells you how high you can actually shout. Calculus of this it's the same law that actually describes an earthquake that actually so it's a logarithmic law which is often left out in a calculus textbook. It's right there, in, you know, somewhere in the book uh, it tells you about it. And so we actually helped the teachers to actually model it. Of course, I did the same exact problem with little kids. And I said, tell me the area of that shape, because I was doing a camp, math mania it was called, and I was asking them to tell me the area of a square, tell me the area of a triangle, and I said, tell me the area of the blob. They were like, what? <laughs> you are fifth graders, and you should be able to tell the area of the blob. And here's what I asked them to do. This is the part they really like. I gave them each a marker. It was a big room like this. I said, well, oh, this is fun for you guys. Actually, it was a chalk piece. Start throwing the chalk pieces on the board. So they started throwing. So some of them fell inside. Some of them fell outside. Right? So they start. And I said, I asked one kid to say, count the number of dots that this study are throwing. Count the number of dots that is falling inside the blob. If you know the area of a circle, that is just a fraction of the dots that fell inside to the fraction of the whole thing. That's it. It's as simple as that. And you just want the area of a blob. Well, how does this work better? Well, take like thousand dots. The kids were like, they had fun the whole day. They're just throwing dots in the board. And uh, but they ended up finding the area of the blob, you know, at least an approximation. By the way, this has a name, it's called Monte Carlo simulation. Okay, so uh, but uh, uh, so, you know, you could come up with these physical systems, you can come up with an analytical solution, but life is not easy. You have to come up with these types of numerical ideas to solve it. So that's numerical solution. As I said, you know, these forms are not complete unless you put analytical numerical solutions together and uh, compare them as, and it is, research is not complete unless you bring the third component, which is external data. So you got to work with somebody, you know, who's collecting data for you and then you want to make sure your, your results make sense. So. Uh, these all, almost always, all these physical systems lead to a system of differential equations, and then you can you have zillions of methods to solve these differential equations. I'm just naming some of them. Usually, the, the, they turn into a system of equations, and there's lots and lots of bridge theory to turn them into matrices, and you can actually solve those things. So this is all things that start from a physical system, and you can actually, you know, uh, there's lots of heavy machinery in mathematics which you can actually once you understand. You can pick and choose. You can say, I'm going to use finite difference method, I'm going to use these methods to solve matrix methods, and I'm going to get the solution. So training kids on these different options itself is a, you know, this is what we do in the summer with kids also. So now I'm going to give you, uh, you know, let me take a few minutes to just talk about different projects that I've worked on and I'm currently working on. So this is uh, where uh, disease comes to town. Uh, certain people are susceptible, and then some of them become infected. And then they actually become recovered. So once they take, uh, uh, you know, some kind of medicine and things like that, but then you can actually model this whole uh, idea of going, going susceptible, infected, and then recovered. This is actually, by the way, Kemrak and uh, McKendrick are the former students of Ronald Ross, the person who actually won the Nobel Prize for tracking the path of malaria. And so there was a statistician and a chemical engineer coming together and coming up with this whole model called SIR. And it turns out that this model has revolutionized uh, ecology, epidemiology, and people now have applied to different types of methods. For example, if it's a sexually transmitted disease, then you're talking about an SIS. Susceptible people get infected, then become susceptible, then become infected. So syphilis, gonorrhea, and things like that will fall into this category. If you want to do something like in malaria, then you want to actually have people being exposed for some time. 
So of course, all these things are 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 you know uh, even though I I wrote out those things as compartmental models, they actually are differential equations. You know, with some rates and things like that. You could apply it to lots of things. In fact, I had a student who finished his masters who took this whole idea and turned it into something in for USGS. Whatever. So he turned into one of this uh, virgin metal. Uh, you know, he was talking about scrap metal, and he wanted to see how to you know come up with a model. And he came up with, you know, some of them go to production, some of them will be used, some of them will be turned into scar. And so he has this, had the same idea and actually came built a, you know, this is a set of different equations he wrote. Uh, you know, here's a, something that he delivered to the USGS where all they have to do is punch in these numbers for different types of metals and it will tell them all the graphs and all this. So this type of tools, a mathematician can actually develop, you know, they can study the stability of these equations. They can also come up with these types of usable tools. Which can be, you know, programmed into any computer, and uh, they could just use it. Uh, you know, so the person at the end user doesn't need to know what the mathematics is. But if it's a reliable one that has been tested well, then they could actually use it for. So this is something that is becoming a trend in applied mathematics now. Uh, you know, fish harvesting. People are interested in, uh, you know, differential equation models where, uh, you know, this is a logistic model, and they add this thing where they want to. This is a yield factor which uh, relates to the catchability of the fish. And people are talking about uh, you know uh, harvesting and how it affects the ecosystem and things like that. Um, modeling social dynamics. This is one of the undergraduate research projects. She came from Houston and she wanted to actually work on uh, Spanish and English uh, regions, uh, uh, you know, uh, in uh, in Houston. And she came up with the model. What? Uh, if, how? How does it uh, happen when socially people exchange, go from one region to another? So she came up with a model. This will be, uh, you know, it's been sent for publication, and she did. You know what happens if government puts extra laws and things like that. So regulation parameters. Again, I don't want to go deep into the mathematics, but I'm just telling you how mathematics is actually used in real world problems. Um, gene expression, modern gene expression. Those are the differential equations that you're seeing there. This is a, a problem with uh, which I'm working on with a student here and Africa actually. So uh, if you can have predators and prey, but then you can also have two species that are working with each other. These are called mutualism models. So, for example, this is an example of a bacteria called Rhizobia working with uh, uh, with this uh, with the legume plant. The bacteria fixes the nitrogen for the plant, and it, it gets its nutrient from the plant. So it's like you scratch my back, I scratch your back. So it's a model called mutualism model. So you have models that do this, and so uh, you have mobile computing, GPS, uh, you know, uh, adulteration again, uh, differential equations. This is all uh, you know, led to master's thesis. Predicting weather, I know that some of you are very interested in you know, either curve fitting or best fit. Now, that's always a big question. What is the difference between curve fitting and best fit? Again, a good numerical class will actually clarify those things. Groundwater applications, uh, we use heavily you know, uh, understanding the chemical contaminant transport. Tobacco cuning, you know, tobacco leaves a plant and then it goes through towns. And how do you actually talk about uh, something called infection diffusion equations and things like that? So, all these are. Uh, examples, uh, let me just go through uh, to the end. Uh, so I'm going to actually skip this because I always prepare, over prepare for my slides. So uh, this is the model that I just wanted to give you an idea. So the, the student that I uh, was working on, uh, working with this, so she wanted to come up with a model for blood flow interaction. So she wanted to just come up with something simple that students can understand. So she said this blood that pumps the wall the wall moves and the wall is going to hit a fluid on the outside. So I need to model the fluid, I need to model the wall, I need to model the blood. Well, the blood pumps it back and forth. So since it's back and forth, I can use something as simple as sines and cosines for capital, pre calculus. I have a wall which is going up and down. I can just model this using spring and mass. And then I have a fluid on the outside, so I could use a, what is called as a wave equation. So she came up with a model and uh, essentially solved it. She actually got an exact solution. It was published in one of the top journals called SAN, uh, which is a you know, big outlet for mathematicians. And uh, then she studied various things. What happens if I make the wall stiffer? What happens when the density of the fluid has changed? And things like that. So uh, how does new ones uh, come about when a teacher came and said, oh, I like this model and I want to take this back to my classroom and I teach slope fields. And so I said, oh, uh, so what do you want to do? So, well, I learned about this word called viscoelasticity. So he said, what is, what is that? Well, that's easy. Take this model and put a damper in it, just like your brakes in the car. So she just went and changed this model. And uh, 
high school teacher, by the way. So and uh, so she went ahead and did this. And then two of the students uh, came to me this last summer, and one of them is uh, part of the honor society. He, he was at MIT this summer. The other one would be at Stanford. So these two students actually went on to win the Siemens, uh, you know, in, in, the, in Virginia, and also they were the finalists. They came forth in the nation for this problem. You can see the title. There's no mathematics there. The word is stability, but it was. You go and read the paper that they wrote. You'll be surprised how much uh, stability analysis they did. And uh, you know, they came up with this idea of uh, patch that can actually tell uh, you know, the level of Alzheimer's uh, in, a way, in a, the initial project. But this is actually to do with <coughs> concussions and how the level of concussion you know, when they form blebs in the, in the lungs. And so you can see how math was used in, in doing these types of uh, problems and all that. So, uh, where can good research come from? Well, you could change assumptions, you could build geometry. I'm going to stop in one minute. Uh, you could do a lot of things. You could modify, uh, you know, mass the experimental data. You can enhance your software that you wrote. You could do good parameter studies. So there's lots of, there's no doubt of uh, projects and all that. So since you asked how I work with teachers in the summer, so I just want to give you uh, this. Uh, yeah, these are teacher designs, so I, I put it on. So let me just talk about this, and uh, these are high school teachers, some of you may recognize this chair at Edison, chair at uh, different schools, so what I give them is a small sensor, an accelerometer, they put it, put it in their throats actually. This is what is called as an oscilloscope, and they actually, I ask them to start humming, so they are like math teachers, they are wondering if they are in the right workshop, and I say, no, no, you are in the right workshop, so they start humming, and then the hum of course becomes waves, and so then we start talking about waves, and we start talking about how they teach this equation in the classroom. So they say, oh, this is, we give them a, uh, we give them this equation. We have an example, temperature of the month, and then we have the, uh, you know, uh, we just ask them to fit the data. Then I say, how do you teach uh, how to fit the data? They say, oh, to find the amplitude, you take the maximum, the minimum, do this. To find the vertical shift, the x maximum, minimum, do this. I said, oh, are the kids learning? Oh, they just remember the formulas. I said, no, they can't. You know, you need something else to actually, you know, get this message to them. So basically, what we did was the Actually, we had a lot of discussion about amplitude and frequency and period and things like that. Then we gave them the challenge. We gave the wave on the screen and said, hum like the wave. Do you understand the question that I'm asking? I can put it to my throat and hum and I can see the wave. But what if I give you a wave and say, hum like the wave? And you really have to hum like the wave. And I've never seen a group of math teachers sing so well. <laughs> but the, what was the impact, you think? What do you think is the innovation? Any ideas? They had to discover what it took to change the wavelength. That's right. They had to discover and they had to really understand what the amplitude. But do you think? What do you know? Do you know what? You started with the problem, and then. They That's right. I started with the problem. I wanted to, uh, you know, I want to finish with this impact. Is uh, is basically this particular chip now is programmed into, uh, you know, so there's this paraplegic who has been coming to Mason, and uh, the people have been trying to figure out what, how he can move and things like that. So one fine day, he was sitting right behind a graduate student. Graduate students are always good. They finish all their work and then they start playing video games. So he was playing video games and he was playing this car racing. So the so this kid was from the back was actually watching him, and uh, and when the car is, they tried everything. He didn't even talk. He didn't do. He didn't respond. You know, to different things. When he saw car racing, he started humming. So he went, mm, you know, just like a car. And that is it. The graduate student ran to the office. He said. Now we know how to make a move. So they actually have this accelerometer in his wheelchair. Now he knows how to move by humming. Mm -hmm. you know, talk about innovation. Talk about taking this back to a classroom and actually telling kids about a story. And so that's a story that I want to make sure you all uh, recognize the importance of mathematics because the kid needs to know what A is, how to control this humming, otherwise he's going to bang in the walls. So yeah. he knows how he's going to go faster or slower things like that. So there's always a story uh, to all these things and so I know I'm sensitive to time so I'm going to actually uh, you know, click all this. And so maybe I'll finish with this small fun thing. I said exponential, right? What is E? You know there's lots of mathematicians and all that. What is E? Maybe someone has one, okay. <laughs> What's that? It's the, the limit. Oh. It's the limit. Wow, yeah. you guys are telling me abstract definition. What is E? <laughs> What's the number? 2.718 uh, something. Okay, so I'm just going to tell you a story and stop. There's only two things you need to know about Andrew Jackson. 
who was the seventh president of the United States, was elected to office in 1828, and 1828. Like every good mathematician should know, the angles of an isosceles right angle triangle is 45, 90, 45. Like I said, you just need to know two things about angles. Okay, so that's a key for you. You won't, you won't get it. So I'll stop you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> So I have some uh, handouts if you want to take and all that. So uh, I've summarized. Uh, this is a. Let me take this one. Also, um, shortly we'll have this this whole lecture up on our website, cause.gmu.edu. Oh, right. um, yeah. um, we taped it, um, and everyone who came in a little later or who didn't sign in, please make sure we've got your email so that we can. Keep you posted about upcoming events. Um, share your science is a regular um, activity that we're doing, so we hope to see you back. And if you're an alumnus or an alumna of George Mason and uh, want to stay in touch, make sure you see me. Get you know, get my card. We'd love to have you more engaged and friends in the community as well. What's the website? Cause cos.gmu.edu.